All right, guys. Well, excellent. So, you know, just going over on what I'd like to teach on, because there's so much to teach on. There was something that when Libby and I were kind of following up with uh, the, the teaching that she did the last couple of weeks, we really didn't have a lot of time to to really focus on on how you guys have overcome offenses in your own lives and your own past with things that you had. And so I think that it'd be really important um, if somebody wants to share. And again, we are recording this, but if it gets very personal, it gets very deep or something really happens here, we don't have to post this on um, on our YouTube, right? So we can, we don't have to, just because it's being recorded doesn't mean that we're going to put it up, but it would be great to hear somebody's, uh, uh, you know, somebody's testimony on, on how you, you got offended, how you worked through that process. And if you worked through that, how many years did it take to work through that process? Uh, what kind of what kind of thing? And then the result of that, the end result of that. Uh, Libby, you wanted to add something to that? No, I was just going to say I forgot to ask you maybe not to record, but you just said you might not post it anyway. Yeah, if it becomes a personal one, guys, we won't. And if you don't want it recorded, then we won't record it. We won't put it on. But uh, consider that this might help other people. So that's the other aspect of it. You're not only ministering to us here tonight, but if you share something that you struggled with and you went through, um, and we and we'll look at scriptures and stuff tonight too. So we're gonna we're not just gonna deal with this, but if if you feel like it could really reach somebody else, then it's fine. As you guys have seen many times over on on Shabbats, I will share personal stuff sometimes up behind the bima, or just you know be a, a be as honest as I can be in situations. Um, but I can tell you, I have a laundry list of offenses in my own life. <laughs> <laughs> where I've offended people and where I've been offended by people. And I've had to work through those processes. I've been the back end of people being offended by me, where they've come and talked to me and said, hey, I need to talk to you about something. And I sit down. My typical response is, oh, what did I do now? <laughs> it's like it's like usually when somebody says, Rabbi, I need to talk to you. It's like, okay, what did I do? <laughs> Because it's like I, I've said so many things and offended so many people that at times, you know, you just get used to it. However, I'm always shocked when somebody says, oh, it has nothing to do with you. It's a personal thing that I'm working through and I need help with it or something like that. I'm like, what? I actually get to be a rabbi? I, gotta be <laughs> I actually get to speak into your life, maybe? So that's always great. And um, but that's always good. Um, but we all have uh, different things here. So, uh, Marlene, I'm going to put you on mute until we can, uh, until we call on anybody. So, I'll mute you. Okay. Um, all right. So, we got more people coming in, and as they they log on, uh, we'll get started here in a second. But I want us to open up in prayer to do it. We know the biblical way of dealing with an offense. We looked at a couple of case studies uh, that so uh, that Libby brought up la two weeks ago, and then last week we talked about them again. And then we shared some other things. And then we took an extension at the end after teaching and taught on Matthew 18. And, and in scholarly world or in the theological world, they call this the Matthew 18 principle. So if you guys have never heard of that, it's simply the Matthew 18 principle. And the Matthew 18 principle is somebody offends you, you go to them and try to work it out. And we didn't spend a lot of time dealing with how deep we should go into that. However, um, I have some suggestions. And so let's go ahead and open up in prayer right now. And then um, after we pray, uh, I'll give some suggestions on the Matthew 18 type of thing and how to deal with this and issues. And, and then we go from there, okay? Avinu Makenu, Father, our King, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this opportunity to, to worship you through study of the scriptures, through fellowship, through encouraging one another, walking together, becoming strong, sharpening each other's countenance, making each other joyful and serving you, Lord. And it's not always easy. It's not always fun. But we are thankful, Lord, that we have each other to, 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 to grow with and to be strengthened with and to also be on our back. I mean, to help us, to stand behind us and to be our back if we need help and love and kindness. And so, Lord, we thank you so much for our brothers and sisters. We thank you for this opportunity you've given us to even breathe and to live, Lord, to serve you. And so we, we want to glorify you and honor you with that. 
ברוך אתה ה' אלוהינו מלך העולם, אשר קידשנו במצוותיו, וטיבנו לעסוק בדברי תורה. אמן. Blessed are you, Lord God, rule of the universe, who sanctifies us in his commandments and commands us concerning the study of the Torah, the study of his instructions. Amen. He says, you shall write them on the doorposts of your home and on the, uh, you know, you shall put them as a, as a bind on your forehead and on your right, you know, your hand. Um, you, we want to do that. We shall, you know, that's why we wear seat seat as well. Uh, for those of you that wear seat seat throughout the entire week. I don't necessarily do it throughout the entire week. Um, I know Thomas does. Thomas has seat seat on him. Um, and some people do it as well. But okay, so let me give some suggestions on the Matthew 18 principle. So how often, how many times should you go to the person that has offended you to try to win your brother over? My suggestion is to go to that person as often as you can, as many times as you can. Okay? They might shut you down the first time you go. Just wait a little while. And, and just be patient. Love them. Pray for them. Walk in no offense towards them. And then go to them again and say, you know, I'd really like to talk to you about this. If they start shutting you down, then at that point is when you need to take it to the next step. Okay. But however, before that entire step goes through, and, and we did talk about this, and I think we highlighted this uh, maybe five weeks ago because it came up in one of our studies in Proverbs, is you need to really work through that process in your own heart first and foremost if you get offended by a brother or sister, to forgive them first and foremost before you even go and talk to them. You should already have a heart of mercy and grace and God's presence when you go to talk to somebody. Because if you go angry and you go with offense, like they offended you and you're carrying that offense and now you're going you're gonna to show them and you're just going to do it, most likely they're not going to receive you, right? And then now it just becomes a, a fight of wills. Who's stronger here? Who's got the more willpower? Who who wants to to be right? And it can go back and forth and back and forth and back back and forth. And so the first step you should always take before you follow through on the Matthew eighteen principle is to walk in forgiveness for a person right off the bat. Walk in forgiveness for that person. Release them to Yeshua. Entrust the Holy Spirit. And here's the issue is you have to trust the Holy Spirit. I remember somebody shared this with me one time. And when they did, it was a revelation to me. And why it wasn't a revelation to me prior to this, I don't know, but it became a revelation to me. And that revelation was, I'm not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay, it seems obvious. Wait, wait, wait. But here's the next step. Okay. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts and draws people to repentance and to change. And a lot of times we want to come in as the Holy Spirit and we want to get somebody to change. We want to 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 tell them this is why I was offended, this is how I got offended and you need to repent or you need to do this or you need to do that. And what happens a lot of times is we step into the role of the Holy Spirit. And we've got to trust God in this, and we have to trust the Holy Spirit. And, th and this is why, uh, and this is really, really important, is because, is because if the Holy Spirit convicted us to be moved to repentance in our own lives, then that means the Holy Spirit can also do it in somebody else's life, not just for us. It's very narcissistic to think somehow that we're the only ones the Holy Spirit speaks to or deals with issues in our lives. So we have to trust that the Holy Spirit's going to deal with that person first and foremost. And I will tell you that when you begin to pray for your brother and sister that may have offended you, or you begin to pray um, for forgiveness for even holding to an offense and asking God to give you grace and mercy and strength to work through that process, that by the time you ever get to the point of following up on Matthew 18 and going to the brother or sister that offended you, you've worked through this process. And many times the Holy Spirit is already dealing with this person in one way or the other, unless they offended you and don't know they offended you. And that's that can happen many times where somebody, they don't know they offended you at all. They just simply offended you and you in, and they're just going along their day, not realizing it at all. But I've also seen where people had no clue that they offended something. And then the Lord, the Holy Spirit revealed to them that they offended a brother and sister. Then they went to that brother and sister and said, hey, 
I think I offended you when I said such and such, or I did such and such. Uh, did I offend you on that? And, you know, it's, it's I've seen it happen with me and with myself being led to do that. And I've had people respond very graciously and say, you know, Rabbi, uh, yeah, that did offend me, actually. Thank you for being sensitive to that. I forgive you for that. And I've already forgiven you for that. And it's like, wow, thank you. I forgive. Thank you for forgiving me. And please, uh, if I do that again or I do something that that offends you, please let me know. And and so this relationship is drawn really close. And then there's other times where I go to somebody and say, hey, I, I think I said something that really hurt you or offended you. And they go, no, not at all. I didn't even think about it. You know, I, I think I had bad gas or something. <laughs> Or they'll say I had the hiccups or they'll say so. You know what I mean? They'll, they're like, you know, because I mean, they'll they just they'll ignore. It. And then there's other people who never want to deal with things. They don't want to deal with conflict. So when you come to them and say, hey, I think I offended you or brother, you offended me because they don't like conflict. It's easy for them to say, no, 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 no. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. No, everything's good. Everything's good. Everything's good. And that's just sweeping things under the rug. OK, so we want to make sure we deal with all those. Marlene, you had your hand raised. Well, there's several things that came to mind. And the first one is that um, there are, you know, I had to be delivered of a spirit of, um, oh gosh, <laughs> I, I'm really too much, um, huh? a, a spirit of um, rejection. And so rejection. a lot of times we get overly sensitive and get um, our feelings hurt because we have a spirit of rejection. So once you're delivered, then when you're offended, I see that for me, I have to stop and say, you know, my spirit of, of rejection is it being, you know, riled up again. And I can speak against it. But also, the greatest part of it all is to me, is that I walk in love. And so, uh, there's the thing Oswald Chambers said, that it's not about being right and wrong, but it's about who Yeshua is in you and show that. So that's one area. The other is when you talked about um, going to uh, your brother and sister or asking them for uh, forgiveness, and we cannot change anyone but ourselves. And that's a fact. And we might make a suggestion. We might um, open their eyes to something if re they'll receive it, but they have to receive it and have to want to do the change. So that's right. another great lesson. But the, my favorite thing is that to show his love and not to be, it's not about my being right or wrong, but learning how to say, forgive, I forgive you or you, or please forgive me. Well, no matter the situation, because the greatest thing is you want that peace between you. You want the love between you. You want to show yeah. Yeshua is in you. Amen. Well, thank you. And I think that I think that um, what we see happen a lot of times is there's a lot of people like me. Now, there's some people who aren't like me at all. But my son, my middle boy, is very much like this in me. Is that I want to see justice. I want to see justice done and served. And so there's this big drive in me to see justice. But oftentimes in seeing justice accomplished, we can get to the point where, where we, we get somebody to do what we want them to do, as opposed to just like Marlene said, we can't change anybody. We can't force anybody to change. All we can do is present something there and then let the Holy Spirit do its work. Um, the Holy Spirit at times may not work with someone that you just approached and it might take a week for them to to filter this through their their mind it might take take a week and a half or so a couple of weeks to go through this whole process of of experiencing that so that is really true um and so yeah, it's wise words there marlene everybody open up to matthew 18 again and i want to read the last part of matthew 18 uh, but go to so we, we talked about uh, we started talking about it, but go to verse 15, but I want to show you something because you'll see how things go hand to hand. And for those of you that are just tuning in, you weren't here last week, let me kind of bring you up to speed a little bit. We had two weeks of really good teaching. I asked Libby to teach and I was going to 
kind of be her covering and, and be her pastoral covering. And she was teaching on a fence and she did a great job the uh, first week of presenting a couple of case studies in the Old Testament um, and then New Testament, some case studies with uh, one in the Old Testament, one with the New Testament. She did a really good job of laying that out. And then the second week is how do we deal with a fence and, and, and the consequences. And I, I like that, that she was talking about consequences. What are the consequences of being offended by somebody? And we talked about a lot of stuff that came up and it was really good. So I want to encourage you when both of those videos are up to get up and go see them. Jacob, are they both up now? Um, or is just the first one still up? Both of them are up. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So Jacob has both of them up on YouTube and I think on Libby's website. I think you've probably put them on your website as well, Libby. Okay, good. So, um, so and Libby, you can you can uh, uh, do a chat and, and give your website on there so people can look it up if they want to go that route too. But um, anyhow, I wanted I wanted to share. Uh, so we talked about it, but look at Matthew eighteen and verse fifteen. And then as we read this, again, before I start, he talks about childlike humility at the beginning of chapter 18. So this is what I was sharing last week. And this is really important for us to understand. We have to have that childlike humility in our lives. We have to be like children. Yeshua says, let the children come unto me. And he says, if you want to inherit the kingdom of heaven, you must become what? Like little children. Why? Because they have this sense of just trust. They don't worry about their food. They don't worry when they're gonna, how they're gonna get fed or clothed or until they start getting older. But children have this amazing walk of trust with their parents. That's all God desires us to be, is to be humble before him. So if you look at chapter 18 first, it starts off, and uh, Libby just posted that for everybody there. So you can always go to the chat and then you can click on there or you can highlight it and copy it and then paste it you know, copy it, and then after we get off tonight, you can paste it and go to the website. All right. So you have childlike humility is the first part of 18. Then it goes right from there into the parable of the lost sheep. And I talked about how important it is for us to understand that uh, that when Yeshua is talking about this, it's not saying go to the rabbi and let the rabbi take care of the lost sheep. This is really important. This is something very active. Uh, dealing with offense in our lives are a corporate, it's a corporate thing. It's not a rabbinical thing where it's just the rabbi and the leaders have to deal with this. This is a corporate thing. This is what each and every one of us have to deal with um, to grow and to mature in the Lord. Okay, so see that you do not, uh, verse 10, and it talks about it, do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father in heaven. And then he talks about it. He goes, what do you think? If a certain man has a hundred sheep. And, and so he talks about that. Okay. So then we get down to verse 15. Now let's go at verse 15 and let's read it. We read it last week, but I want to read the entire rest of the chapter too, because it's powerful. Now, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault while you're with him alone. So again, he's talking about humility and then goes into the lost sheep. Right. Then he says, now, listen, if your brother sins against you. So he's connecting this to a lost shepherd like a, or a lost sheep among the people. OK, so if somebody offends you, you could become that lost sheep or the person that you offended could become that lost sheep. So we have to take care of that. Now, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault while you're with him alone, alone. If he listens to you, you have one your brother. But if he does not listen, take with you one or two more, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may stand. Now, I shared with this last week that I believe that the one or two witnesses um, are elders because they're referred to as witnesses in the Tanakh, along with the uh, the the men of the community at the gate of like at the at the at the tent of Abraham. This isn't one of the things where you first bring them to the elders to get them in trouble. You're just asking an elder to come as a witness as you try to approach your brother again or your sister again. But it goes deeper. But if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the Messiah's community. And if he refuses to, to listen even to Messiah's community, let him be, be to you as a pagan and tax collector. So here we see these three-step process here where you where you, you bring along an elder as a witness, and then you may need another elder as another witness again. It gets to the point where the elders are coming together. If one person is just refusing to deal with this, and the other person has exhausted everything, or the other person just gives it up. Sometimes the other person just simply says, you know what? This is this doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere. I forgive you. I just need to move on. 
and sometimes it's dealt with like that. Okay. Um, um, but anyhow, let's move on. So at verse 18, amen, I tell you, whatever you forbid on earth will have been forbidden in heaven, and what you permit on earth will have been permitted in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. So here he is going right into this about, about working through an offense. And then he's saying, whatever you forbid, it shall be forbidden. Whatever you bind or permit, it shall be permitted. This is midah keneged midah. This is measure or measure. This is a Hebraic understanding of, of not just so much measure for measure. Um, uh, hold on, Libby, while you're doing some stuff there, that kind of distracts me because that pops up on the screen. So uh, hold on with your, your stuff there. Thank you. Um, uh, so... By forbid forbidding and permitting, um, what happens is we've been given this authority, the keys of the kingdom, to help establish halakha, uh, how one walks. This is not just used for spiritual warfare in the sense of saying, I permit this, this or I, I forbid this demonic activity uh, to take place in somebody, or I, I bind you in the name of Yeshua, be gone. It's not so, it's binding and loosing is the process here. Some passages. I mean, some translations actually use binding and loosing here. Okay, but this one, our, our thing says forbid. Uh, the TLV uses forbid and permit. They're all the same thing, but it's basically binding and loosing. And so Yeshua is telling us we have authority in these matters. So when a rat, when a rabbinical court, uh, like the elders, and now like the bait din, take somebody who cannot, who does not want to change and who does not want to repent of something, that has become a huge an offense, and then they bring it before the congregation. Okay, when they when they make this and they forbid that person from coming back to the services, then that God will uphold that, and that's pretty wild, but it's true, right? Okay, so as you go through this whole process, now watch what it says in verse twenty one. This is where it gets really important. So obviously. Peter's listening to this. Other people are listening to this. Then he gets in here. He goes, Then Peter came to him and said, Master, how often shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And Yeshua said to him, No, not up to seven times, I tell you, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. So he says up to 70 times. Seven, which is 490 times. Anybody ever forgive their brother or their sister or their spouse 490 times in one day? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe you had a really bad marriage and you had to you had to forgive your husband up to 490 times. And maybe you're keeping track. You're like, oh man, I'm already at 480 here. I only got 10 more to go, and it's only four o'clock in the afternoon. You're gonna do the unforgivable. <laughs> Some of you may have had that bad of a marriage, okay? <laughs> so I, I'm not going to say that you haven't, okay? But the thing is, the thing is, is that it's it's a it's an idiom. It's a Hebraism that basically means, hey, as many times as it takes, forgive your brother. That's really what it's saying. It's 70 times 7 is basically saying, hey, listen, there's not really a limit to this. And that's why he said 70 times 7. You know, basically, if you were to see Yeshua talking with Peter, like seven times, come on, man, it's 70 times 7. And Peter's probably thinking there, what, 490 times? What, what, what? And, and Yeshua is just simply saying, listen, listen, it, it's more than just the amount of times you need to forgive your brother. You need to just walk in forgiveness and forgive them all the time, okay? Now, this doesn't mean that you open up an avenue for continual abuse. It's okay to have boundaries. It's okay to have um, boundaries set up that for, for that will protect you, okay? I, I really need to make that. I need to stress that. That's really important. If you are in a, an abusive relationship or you... Um, or your your husband continues or your wife continues to uh, commit adultery, right? And you've forgiven them, but how many times do you have to forgive them? Well, it's, you know, you have to look, set up some boundaries, the hurt and the pain and all the stuff that happens. You might have to simply say, listen, I need to, to make a change here. I need to set up a boundary. I need to divorce my spouse because of adultery. And that's that's permitted in scripture. But if it's abuse and that kind of thing, it's over, I'm talking like massive abuse over and over and over verbally and emotionally and stuff like that. You have to set up boundaries. Um, 
and and help needs to take place. There needs to be counseling, deliverance, whatever it takes to get healing from that situation if that person refuses to do it. But he goes he goes on to say this. So when he had begun to settle up with a man, to settle up, a man was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Okay, today that would be about sixty, about 6,000 denarii for about 16 years of wages. Okay, think about that for a minute. 16 years of wages in my field, you know, with what I get paid now, that'd be like, wow, that's a lot of money. Okay, um, but since he didn't have the money to repay, his master ordered him to be sold along with his wife and children, all that he had, and payment to be made. Then the slave fell on his knees and he begged him, saying, be patient with me and I will repay you everything. I mean, this is a massive debt. Massive debt. Um, 16 years of wages. And so it's probably comparable to this person's one year wage. So he's sitting there thinking, be patient with me. I'll take care of it. I'll, pay, I'll repay you. I'll repay you. Right? So now the, 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 the person has to sit there and think, the king has to sit there and think, okay. Do I allow this person who makes this amount of money, which is 16 years of his wages, be patient with him enough to pay all this back? He goes, please be patient with me. I'll repay you everything. Verse 27. And the master of the slave, filled with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. Again, when we read the word about when we read about king and a kingdom, that gives us an idea of Yeshua and how he rules his kingdom. So remember, that's kind of like a... a uh, what what's the word I'm looking for? It's synonymous. It's synonymous with Yeshua and his rule of a kingdom. So think about this. Every time he says a king, he talks about his kingdom. He's talking about how he rules his kingdom and how he sits on that throne as the king. Okay, so it's not always, but most of the time you can definitely refer it to this. And then he goes now, so he filled with compassion, released him and forgave him. Now that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. Okay, a hundred denarii out of out of the other one was <laughs> thousands of talents. So a denarii is really small. A denarii uh, is tiny in comparison, okay? It's like, it's it's hardly nothing. And he grabbed him and he started choking him saying, pay back what you owe me. Pay back what you owe. Pay back what you owe. So now he's been forgiven all this stuff and he's been forgiven his debt completely. By the king, 16 years of wages completely gone. And somehow now he's really upset because he feels the pressure now to get that money that he would have had to pay the king, even though the king forgave him it. So what did he do is he goes to somebody who owed him pennies on the dollar compared to what he had. And he goes, so his fellow slave fell down and kept begging him, saying, be patient with me and I will pay you back. Yet he was unwilling. Instead, he went off and threw the man in, into prison until he paid back all he owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply distressed. They went to their master and reported uh, in detail all that had happened. Then summoning the first slave, his master said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave all that debt because you pleaded with me. Wasn't it necessary for you also to show mercy to your fellow slave, just as I showed mercy to you? Enraged, the master handed him over to torture, to the torturers, torturers until he paid back all he owed. So also my heavenly father will do to you unless each of you from your hearts forgives his brothers. Wow. This is powerful. So let me go to gallery mode, uh, gallery mode here real quick so I can see everybody. Okay. This is powerful guys, because this sets us on a stage of, of, <laughs> You may be offended, and the offense may be tremendous, and it may be great. But what is greater, and the weight that is on you, which is even greater, is walking in forgiveness. That's the greater measure of, of weight that is on us. Because if we don't walk in forgiveness towards our brother who has sinned against us, very likely that impatience of the king happens to us. You guys catch what I'm saying there? Can everybody catch what I'm saying there? Okay. Does anybody want to add to that or anybody want to want to speak into that? Libby, you want to say something towards that? I'll put you on the spot. Just 
She's got to decide whether she's going to unmute or not. <laughs> now you can post a bunch of stuff. I, I finished that little segment. You can post stuff on the chat now. Um, okay, so so what I was saying, this is really important. Who wants to speak? Anybody want to add to what I was saying here? This is pretty powerful. So what he's saying here in this, go ahead, Libby. I just wanted to apologize. It's just that some of my videos are a little bit longer. And that video that I talked about is short. It's like seven minutes long. So I was oh, talking. Wow. Yeah, I was talking about how that's a. If Paul wrote a letter to the people of America, what would that look like? So that's that's <laughs> that. Video. Yeah. And then. Oh, that'd be a long letter. <laughs> There's an exciting video coming, and I'll shut up. There's an exciting video coming. One of my friends has MS, and we've been praying for her healing, and God healed her. Praise she can God. without a walker. I mean, this is modern day, 2024. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when I post that video, I'll let you know, because that it's her testimony. Wow. Praise God. Thank you, Libby. Thank you. Okay. So, so what he's saying basically here, guys, is that he also says this is not only is the weight in the bear on us to forgive our brother and sister, right? And the Lord tells us to cast our cares upon him for he cares for us much. He literally says in many, uh, another passage is that if you can't forgive your brother, I cannot forgive you. Now, why do you think God says that? What's the reason why he would say, if you cannot forgive your brother or your sister, I cannot forgive you? Why would God say that? Here's God who, who, who is a miracle worker. Here's God who can do the impossible, who says that he can't actually forgive us if we don't forgive a brother or sister. Anybody want to speak into that? Thomas, do you have anything? You like? Well, let's see. Libby's hand is raised. Okay, go ahead, Libby. And then Thomas. We're called to be like him. We are made in his image. And how can we spend eternity with him when we can't have compassion on our brothers and sisters? Amen. Amen. Thomas? I was going to say kind of the same thing, the fact that um, he can't forgive us. If we can't forgive others, he can't forgive us because our heart's not in the right place and that there we can't stand in front of him if our heart's not in the right place. And I've actually been contemplating this particular scenario for a while now, because my sister and I um, do not have the greatest relationship. Matter of fact, I think she generally dislikes me. I have nothing against her. I, I think she's a little on the snooty side. Um, I think the sun generally passes over her nose before it touches the earth some mornings, but that's just the way my sister was. That was, the people she hung out with. I accept that about my sister. I love her very much, but she still believes I'm the same person I was 40 years ago. And before the you resentment, saved, before, yeah. oh yeah, long, be no, I, I was a heathen. I was a horrible little heathen. And I didn't do the right things in life. I, I took advantage of people. I lied. I, I, I didn't really steal, but I manipulated people usually my parents to give me money to help me out my sister held that that she's held that against me for 40 years up to the point that even when my parents died we had the the, the she was upset that my parents gave her that I, and generally she was upset my parents gave me anything and didn't give it all to her but it was in a in a will she couldn't do anything about it long story short I've been contemplating figuring out how to write a letter to my sister to tell her that I forgive her for all of the resentment, all of the anger, all of the hatred that she holds against me. And I, I want to release her from it, but I know she's going to take it in a defensive way and take it as though I'm trying to be pious and, you know, upright and better than her. And I, I, I'm struggling with a way to phrase it that she will understand that I'm doing this with an open heart, with all humility, 
and truly giving her forgiveness so that she can get on with her life and not hold hatred for me in her heart. And I, I'm, I pray on it a lot. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> My cat decided she wanted to talk to me. <laughs> yeah, we see a tail hanging up. This again. Yeah, it's her, pay, her, her nose was like right here. Um, but so I'm trying to figure out how to say this in a godly Christian loving way that she may not understand, but she at least tries to, you know, it, it may at least find a little sliver in that heart that's still soft. Yeah. I'm not sure. I would, I would encourage you to write it. I would encourage you to write it. First of all, talking about you and saying, you know, I know I haven't been an easy brother. I know that I've made a lot of mistakes and offended. I would go that route first and say, you know, mm -hmm. I want to also let you know that I forgive you for some of the things that you've done in my life and maybe mention them. I, I did this years ago with my dad. I actually wrote a letter to my dad when I was a brand new saved, when I heard about restitution and reconciliation. I had never really understood those concepts. And what I did was uh, wrote a letter to my dad. My dad never acknowledged that he got the letter, never had mentioned in there whether, you know, what I said was valid or not. But I knew I had to work through that process, whether he received it or not. So I think with you, you know, I think that, I mean, it takes courage to do that. And I would encourage you to do it. Um, and because it sounds like the Holy Spirit's prompting you to do that. So this is where, again, we, we can't really change somebody's re response or reaction to that. All we can do, all we can do is, um, um, all we can do is submit to the Holy Spirit and trust him to bring conviction to her. And it could be the catalyst that gets her to uh, put her nose down a little bit so the sun can hit all of us first. <laughs> okay, so that's a possibility. It's funny, he's from Nebraska, I'm from Wyoming. That's a very West concept. I don't know if some of you guys on the East Coast have heard stuff like that, but it is a very Western concept. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jarrett, you have your hand raised. We're we're talking about why why does the Lord say that even though He's the God of the invisible or the in the impossible, not the invisible, the God of the impossible, why does He say I cannot forgive you unless you forgive your brother uh, or your sister in, in, first? And you know, so go ahead, Jarrett. You had your hand raised. Yeah, I mean, I feel I, I think that the unforgiveness itself is then who are we, you know, to hold something against our brother when God has forgiven us and it makes us judge. It's almost like a form of idolatry where we put ourselves in God's place. Yeah. Amen. And, you know, we do the, our father of Inu. We do the, uh, of Inu, our father every week, not every week at our services, but when we have time, we try to do it. But the Avinu is our father. Forgive us of our debts of our sins first. It's always forgive me first, then forgive those who have sinned against me, those who have indebted again, have a debt against me or have debted against me, so to speak. Um, that's pretty powerful when we look at it like that, because it's really important for us to understand that, that God, God uh, really wants us to get the log out of our own eyes so we can see the speck in another's eye. Now, one of the reasons uh, that he did say this, and I think you guys all highlighted it on there, but when he does say, if you cannot forgive your brother who sins against you, I cannot forgive you, is because he partners with us. And because he partners with us, and this is very close to what uh, Libby and, and Thomas was saying, and, and what Jared was saying, uh, because he partners with us, he does not force himself on us. He will not force us to do something that is contrary to what our hearts and our, our own choices is going to be. This is why the consequences of our unforgiveness is very severe. This is why we this entire story, and if again, if you look at chapter 18, it's talking about being little children, doesn't spend much time doing that, just a few chat, I mean, a, a few verses, several verses. Then it goes into, um, you know, again, um, it goes into the lost sheep, and it's just a few verses. And then right after that, it goes into restoring a lost brother. So it's talking about humility and, and going how important it is to take care of business. Then it spends a, the rest of the chapter in, in almost the same amount of verses that it does on all of those other ones. 
it uses up almost about a third or two thirds of it to explain to us this story of a guy who could forgive somebody who owed him just a little bit, but yet was forgiven a tremendous amount. And when we put that over into what God has forgiven us for, just take a look at your own life and look at what God has forgiven on your end and says, basically, I take those sins and I cast them as far as east is from west and I remember them no more. Oh, wait, sorry. East from west and I will remember them no more. OK, when he says that he's forgiven us a huge amount of debt. So how could we who have such little anger towards a brother or sister or because they offended us, we can't forgive them. That's that scenario is there. And, and again, when you look at this, this 16 years of wages has been forgiven. And then all of a sudden, this guy can't forgive a few pennies, a few dollars. Right. Like a month's worth of wages compared to 16 years of wages. So it's really important that we understand this concept, because if we are not forgiving or walking in this attitude of forgiveness, forgiving our brother and sister before we ever try to deal with their offense, then what, what happens is we step in as the Holy Spirit. We step in and try to convict. We step in and try to control. And that's just not simply how God operates. And if we operate that way, God won't have any part of that. You won't see through it. You won't see the power of the Holy Spirit in your life operate through forgiveness as we release people. Uh, go ahead, Libby. When you said that God doesn't make us, um, you know, go against what's in our heart and made me think of what Marlene said. You know, since we're made in his image and we should act like him, we shouldn't try to make anybody do something out that they may not want to do. So that just spoke to me. That's right. Yeah, that's huge. It, it really is. It's huge. And so that's why he says he can't forgive us. It's not because he doesn't want to. It's not because he really he really can if he wants to. But actually, he limits himself saying, I can't. I can't do this because your heart is hard. Your heart is not willing to receive absolute forgiveness. Your, your heart is not ready to receive what I can pour out into you. So it really is a self-examining type of thing that we need to do. And just like he says in Matthew and other passages, take the plank out of your own eye first so you could see clearly enough to help remove the speck out of someone else's life. You know, the other day or uh, yesterday, I was at, um, where did I go? I, I had some errands I had to do. But I was in a place where this lady was offended, and I got to remember where I was at, either at the uh, at a restaurant or at the grocery store. I can't remember where I was at. But what was amazing was that there was this lady that was getting offended by somebody else and, and gossiping to somebody else. Oh, it was last night when we went to dinner. We went to dinner last night, and inside there was like a lady that was uh, getting offended. Um and, and I'm looking at it, I'm sitting there thinking, wow, we get so offended so easily by everything that happens around us. Now, I'm not talking about believers. Believers, we shouldn't get offended so easily, but we do. And when we get offended, what we got to do is we got to rise above that and say, Lord, you know, look at the amount of debt you forgave in my life. I can forgive this person of that. And it takes, it takes you know, it takes a lot, but we are called to do that. And it doesn't matter what culture what race we are, what background we have. Uh, it doesn't matter if we think we deserve it to be angry. Uh, you know, I'm always surprised when we say, well, I deserve to be angry, or I deserve to be upset about this. It's like, uh, no, you don't. <laughs> okay, so it's very strange. Uh, Jacob, go ahead. Your hand is raised, and then uh, Libby. Okay, so and then Marlene, then. on the one of and the, one. One of the uh, things that I've learned from the Holy Spirit is that whenever I get into that mode where I feel like I'm judging someone, I always hear him say to me, well, didn't you do that too? And even if you didn't do that, haven't you done other things that are just as worse? And I'm like, you're right. So that leads me to Yeshua said, I don't judge anybody. I and mean, even if I do, it's justified because I speak directly from the father as to say, you know, we have a lot of people in this country in other countries and they're saying oh man this john this donald trump is so bad oh man this joe biden is so bad oh man this bill gates is so bad oh man this other person is so bad and i'm like yo how can you judge this person 
when you're drinking, you're smoking, you're potentially fornicating, you're masturbating, or you're doing things before God that are so incredibly grievous to him. And I'm talking about believers and non-believers. And at the end of the day, all these people are going to be put in the line on the left or the right, and they're all going to be judged. I'm just asking our fellow believers, just pray for these people. Don't judge whether they're good or they're evil, because Yeshua didn't judge whether they were good or they were evil. He just said, pray for even your enemies. Just pray for them. Yeah, good word. Good word. I think that that's a very important one, especially in today's day and age where uh, we have all of our rights and we have this and we have that and we want to stand on our rights. And that's, you know, that's that self-justification where we want to see ourselves justified or believe in a certain way, but uh, you're right. It's 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 minute in the overall scale. We definitely pray for them. We have to make a conscious effort, though, to to uh, vote and to pray according to our conscience. Right? We have to do those kinds of things. But you're right. We take the higher ground of praying for our enemies, praying for people that we disagree with. Um, you know, it, I think it's uh, you said something there that was really really good. Um, and and I like what you had your approach on that, and that's really it's really important. Uh, Libby, go ahead. When you said um, about God not God recognizing that our heart is hard when we refuse to forgive, it reminded me of a lot of stuff that I went over. Like it's it used words like a, a, a someone with offense is unassailable. Uh, and then that that scripture was saying it's e it's easier to take a a fortified city. A fortified city is uh, an unforgiving person is harder than an un than a fortified city. I mean, it's um, yeah, that people get hard when they are harboring offense. Oh, yeah. So this is a huge life lesson for us. This is huge. Um, it really is a powerful passage of teaching of forgiveness. And again, I got to tell you, forgiveness doesn't mean that we allow the person who's continuously abusing us to abuse us or somehow we forget. What we do is when we forgive, we release that person to the Lord, release them for the Holy Spirit to do his work. And then we back off and let God do what he does. And then we establish healthy boundaries and simply say, listen, I can't can't spend time with you anymore. I can't talk with you anymore. I can't fellowship with you anymore, at least for a little while, because it seems like we just, I'm getting hurt and you get hurt. And, and, you know, sometimes I can't talk to you. Sometimes you can't talk to me. And I think if we always approach it in that way of simply saying, you know, if, if we approach it with the attitude is I need to do this because I'm struggling here. I'm struggling with being angry and upset and and walking in unforgiveness when we deal with it like that people don't often feel threatened by that they feel more released to simply say okay i hear what you got to say you know um that kind of thing and then you just trust that the holy spirit as you pray for them that the holy spirit's doing his work but this is stuff we should be doing in the in the interim before we ever get to the place where we approach a brother and and tell them that they've sinned against us and so therefore here's the sin they did and therefore they need to repent right that type of thing so uh marlene go ahead well um in uh, in ee which i used to be part of years ago uh, um, um <clears throat> wow it hits me all the time anyway evangelism explosion just for some people who didn't know what that was yeah but it wouldn't um come out <laughs> anyway um they you no know, big part of our witness was how God is, even though he's merciful and forgiving, but he's a just God. And so that's really important to remember. But the greatest reason to do this is to forgive. And everything God says is because he said it. And so I don't yeah. think a lot of times all the explanations and everything don't really matter because if that's what God says, then it's important because he said it. Right. Some people don't mot aren't motivated by that. 
just because God said, <laughs> well, okay, well, mom said or dad said, <laughs> yeah, but why did they say that? You know, but you're right. Uh, because he said it, that should be enough as a, that should be good enough as it is. But I like what you said at the very beginning, because he's a just God, he will deal with it justly. Just like Jacob said that, hey, leave it up to God. He's going to do the separation of the sheep and goats. He's going to take care of this thunder. He's going to bring the ultimate judgment. And that is true because he is a just God. But if you notice how how this, this passage lays out, is that he's just to deal with us if we don't walk like him in this manner. Because he's forgiven us a huge amount. And if therefore, if we can't forgive our brother or sister just a tiny bit, he will deal with us. So this is pretty powerful. So let's let's talk about one aspect of this. So what do you do when this person who has offended you or you've offended and you have to go to that person is in is in leadership okay or they're the senior rabbi i know that uh we've had people we've had people come to our uh congregation who were offended by another leader uh, from other different congregations so we don't i'm not trying to single out any congregation i know that people have left our congregation and have gone to other congregations because they were offended by me um, and there are some people who are not coming to Beth Yeshua at all because somebody had shared something or said something or a woman spoke up and said something behind the beam of God, God forbid, you know, and and they left Beth Yeshua, all this kind of stuff. How do you deal when it's a leader that has offended you? So let me just leave that open here for you guys. Just who wants to answer that? Let's try to get somebody else who hasn't spoke up tonight because I know some uh, there's a lot of people on here tonight and I really want everybody to try to speak in this but how do you how do you go to someone the person who has offended you and you've been forgiving them but you're you belong to the congregation and you haven't approached them about a particular thing uh because they're a leader they're or the senior leader how do you deal with it how do you follow through on matthew 18 in this situation when they're obviously a leader who wants to tackle that one who hasn't spoke yet we have Ingrid, we have Margaret, Jacob's got his hand raised, so I will, uh, Michelle, how about Michelle, Shema, uh, or Thomas has spoken once, but uh, Junior, or, or uh, let's see, I just want to say, or Leah. I wanted to say something very quickly. This is a very important topic, because <laughs> you can hide behind that offense, and you can hide that offense in your heart, and nobody can see it. It's one of those sins of the For heart. For years years and remember god yeah. at the heart it's really um a very important thing to deal with amen and before somebody else speaks into it, like leo or somebody um i think of yoda i know here i am going with my sci-fi <laughs> sci-fi illustrations but it's like mm. Hatred leads to anger. Anger leads to, you know, and he goes off and he goes into the dark side, you know, and he goes into the whole thing type like that. Unforgiveness leads to bitterness. It really does. And bitterness leads to all kinds of stuff that happens in our lives. And our physical bodies start manifesting that stuff. And so if we hold on to unforgiveness and, and it leads to these other aspects of bitterness, and hatred and all these other things we are actually destroying our own bodies and uh, uh ingrid can probably speak into that a little bit so before jacob speaks uh who wants to speak into this ingrid leah marguerite but uh but you know we we're still on the subject of how do you deal with a leader somebody who's specific in this it doesn't want to i could see it in her face it doesn't matter it doesn't matter but it doesn't matter who. I just want somebody to speak into it outside of Libby, Jacob, Marlene. So, okay, who else wants to do it? Who else wants to speak up? Well, I'll just make a comment. I mean, okay. I've been okay, good, blessed. I, I mean, I've been blessed that I haven't had a situation where I, you know, been offended by um, a leader per se, I mean, or to that extreme that I had to go to them to ask for forgiveness or anything like that. So, I mean, that's why I really, you know, didn't want to comment on that. And that's my two cents regarding. Oh, that. thank God. There's nothing hidden there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 
<laughs> so yeah, okay, well, so go ahead. Go ahead. that's that's I what I wanted to share. Listen. <laughs> okay, great. All right. So go ahead, Jacob. What were you gonna say? Rabbi, are you trying to find out if people are offended at you? No, <laughs> no, 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 not no. at all. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Jacob. <laughs> all right. So ah God, I have a headache. This computer is way too low and I've been hunching into it and now I have a headache. It's been happening too much. Anyway, it's because I'm working on photos, but it has nothing to do with what I'm about to say. So just disregard what I'm about to say with the, from, from before. Am I confusing you? I hope not. Okay, let me start. So there was once there was once a congregation that I went to. And before I went to, while well, I was at the congregation, I went to a friend's house. Uh, and this friend was talking to me. And he said to me, you know, man, and I was, he was like leaning and he's like, come here, come here. And I'm like, all right. I'm like, I'm listening. And he says, I kind of think that Yeshua is God. And I went, dude, you've been cooking for way too long, dude. Like, what are you smoking, bro? And I was like, what is this dude talking about Jesus being God? I was like, I already accepted he's the Messiah. Like, what do you mean he's God? So this other rabbi had come into the congregation claiming that Jesus wasn't. And I was like, this dude makes sense to me. So I'm talking to this dude and I'm talking to the senior rabbi of this congregation. I bring up to him and I go, yo, man, I don't think that he, I, you know, at the time I didn't think he was, you know, who I said he, who he said he was. And the rabbi's like, what are you smoking, bro? You've been cooking for too long. And he's like, we're gonna have to talk about this later. So I literally, I go home and I'm like, mm, I'm not too happy about this. I'm, I'm kind of offended. So I come back next week. And the rabbi is like, we're doing baptisms. And I'm like, yes, I get to be baptized and I get to speak in tongues like this other musician does. I'm going to be so awesome. I'm going to do awesome things with these tongues, even though I don't know what it sounds like, but whatever. Okay. So I go back to the congregation and the rabbi sits down with me and he goes, listen up, man, I got to tell you something. And I'm like, what do you got for me? Like, what else could you say to me that would not offend me? He's like, listen, if you don't believe that Jesus is God, then you can't get baptized. And I was like, what the snap in the snap, bro? Like, what are you talking about? Now you're cooking for too long. I was like, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that should be enough. And I'm like, I'm so offended. So the next weekend I was like, I'm not coming back. I'm going back to the Chabad where they believe in only the father. And I can't tell them that I believe in Jesus because they'll kick me out, but I'm going anyway. So I go to this Chabad and literally the Holy Spirit's like, you shouldn't be here, man. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Now you're cooking too much. And so I'm literally there and everyone is like, like low humming this chant that's like super wrong and not of God at all. And all their eyes are black. And I'm like, okay, something's wrong here. I got to go back to this congregation. So I go back to the congregation. So then I go to the rabbi and I'm like, listen, rabbi, you totally offended me, like really offended me a lot. And we need to talk about this. And he's like, all right, let's talk about it. So we, after service, we sit down and we're in the back room and I'm like, you offended me. Now what? And he's like, well, according to the Matthew 18 principle, and he explained Matthew 18 to me. And then he said to me, listen, can you forgive me for offending you? And I was like, all right, whatever. I was like, okay, fine. And so we, we got along. And then I missed the baptism in the pool that we were supposed to do. And then I ended up getting baptized in the ocean. On the same day, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit and we got pizza on the same day. Three things happened at once because I forgave my rabbi. And that rabbi was Rabbi Adrian A. Bernal. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's a great story. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Marlene, before I call on you, I think uh, somebody else had their hand up uh, no, there for a second. Hand up. Michelle Brown. Who? Who? Michelle Brown had her hand. Oh, Michelle Brown. Go ahead, Michelle Brown. Um, and then before uh, Marlene, or yeah, Michelle, and then Marlene, and then uh, let me thank you very much. That's a wonderful story, Jacob. I knew it was about me after we after I heard you saying something about no, you got to get saved. You got to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. You got to believe in Yeshua as the as God first. I can't baptize you. And like that was only the first half of the story, by the way. I was literally walking to my fridge in the middle of that. And I literally had a vision of Yeshua and the Father, like going in and out of each other, like simultaneously. And I looked at my cat and I said, did you guys see that? And they were like, no. And I was like, 
all crud. Like that was the tipping point. I was like, okay, this is yeah. for real. Like, <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. All right, Michelle, go ahead and uh, share. Hi. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, for me, when you are dealing with um, probably the head pastor or rabbi or whoever that you deal with, one, start with the spirit of humility. Um, being able to go and speak to them, let them know um, what you're feeling. But also, I would say, first pray, seek the Holy Spirit to get guidance and counseling. Because yes, it is about following the word, but also following the spirit of what's going on. I think every case sometimes is a little different, um, depending, because um, some offenses sometimes by pastors may be an ongoing offense that they're not ready to receive. Sometimes they're not willing to receive um, what is being said, what is being said or what is happening in a congregation. So I think that um, seeking the spirit, asking the spirit what to say to that, to that leader, um, how to go about it, to speak about it. In some cases, even though there may not be another rab, it might might be another rabbi in, or uh, an executive pastor that you can bring in to as a witness um, in there to right. talk. So there are ways of doing it where it might not be someone above them, but if there's an executive pastor or an, another minister or someone else in the congregation to be your witness, you're able to do that. Okay. Very good. Very good, Michelle. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Uh, Marlene? Well, two things. One is the aspect of how unforgiveness affects us. And I saw it for myself. I had a sister who was terribly unforgiving and angry and, you know, was very sensitive. And she died of breast cancer. I had another friend who had a very similar personality and a great anger. And she too died of, of ca breast cancer. And I read about some doctors who did research in Texas somewhere and that they came up with how our anger, how our unforgiveness, whatever it is, and it was related to God, but how that all affects our health. And it's not unusual for someone to be affected with cancer, whether it's breast cancer, or yeah. whatever, but it can really eat away in our body. Number one. Number two is that uh, in a situation with, you know, a, your leader Look. that you get angry at or you're upset with. I had that happen with me. And my, I called my daughter. I was so angry, and I walked out of Temple, and I was just so angry at Rabbi Joe. And uh, and she said, but Mom, you're a cannibal to him. And he's your leadership, and he's your oversight. And he, ha he, has, he has the right to speak into your life about what the situation was, which was the jail ministry I had at the time of my own, beside the one I was part of. And um, he decided to close it down because of somebody aggravating him about it. And I was just so upset. And I left the temple really angry. And she said, you need to come and apologize. And I really got convicted because we must be accountable to our leadership. And so they're not always perfect. Neither are we, but we need to accept. That's my opinion. So... Sometimes we see flaws, but they need to get convicted themselves because we're not going to change it. So, but I did have that experience, and and what a relief when you say I'm sorry, and when you see that you're wrong. Yeah. But we are accountable to you. We're accountable to leadership, and so if you're going to sit under them, then we have to accept everything. And sometimes if it's really simple to just say, well, maybe it's not such a good idea, you know, or something like that. But, you know, it's like to go along with whatever you decide. So I think that's really important. We are accountable to our leadership. 
Amen. And to see her believes that so seriously and so hard. And I'm grateful to her Thank for you. Yeah. Amen. And that's really important um, that we get that understanding. But at the same time, that accountability goes both ways. And, you know, not leaders don't always. It's hard. It's. A lot of times, very successful rabbis are also very motivated rabbis, and uh, they're motivated or something like that, and they seem unapproachable. And obviously, at times, we're human, so it seems like when you go to somebody, whether they're a pastor or they're the senior leader, um, it's very easy for them sometimes not to receive, or you maybe feel like, okay, it's hard to go to them. I can't really approach them because they're just going to shut me down. And we can build up scenarios in our own head and do that. And at times, maybe they do shut you down, um, but it's still worth going to them, right? So I'll give some some stuff that we can do here. But Thomas, go, he's had his hand raised. So let's, let's do Thomas, and then let, let's get back to this subject where I can teach on it a little bit more. Go ahead, Thomas. So I always look at things before I decide – if I need to talk to the other person, am I offended because you did something that's actually, you did something wrong or am I perceiving what you did as something I didn't like or that's not in my comfort zone and therefore I, I'm offended by it. I, I don't want, I, I won't go to the person who I think offended me because I didn't like what they did they didn't do anything wrong. Their, their, their version of it could be exactly correct in the sense of their personality, their idea of what doctrine is, their idea of how liturgy should go. It, to me, those aren't offenses to take to, a, to, the, to the leadership. Those are offenses that you have to pray about and figure out how to deal with in your own self because they're not doing anything that needs correction. It's really just your personal opinion of what, is going on that needs a correction and and maybe maybe you can just overlook it and find the other parts of the liturgy that you like or the other parts of the service that you like or or it, those are a lot different than say you know you 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 depending on you, you have a conversation with one of the leaders and you depend on what's about to happen and then you know within a, a short period of time all of a sudden their plans change and they don't tell you about it until, you know, a period of time that makes it so short that you can't really fix what, what they, you know, you generally, it, you make a date with them, they break it. And it's so, so close to the date that you can't change it. And so it messes everything up. That's probably an offense. You could go back and talk to somebody about if they're willing to listen to you. Right. But when it comes to, you know, just, Oh, I, I don't agree with the way that particular liturgy goes. I, I don't like that particular prayer or, you know, those are personal things to the person that, that's offended by it. Figure it out for yourself because it's not the leadership that has the problem. It's you. And so you, you have to discern. <laughs> you have to discern whether it's really a problem or it's really a personality conflict or an opinion conflict, and that becomes your problem, not a, a Matthew 18 thing. So now I'll let you get back to what you do. Right. No, I think that's really good, is to know the difference between a true offense and just an opinion. And I think that's really important, too, because I do get a lot of people that come in, why do we have to do this? Or we, why do we have to do the liturgy? Or why do we have to do this song in the liturgy? Can you do this or can you do that? That happens a lot. Our leaders get that all the time. Uh, everyone will get an email every once in a while that'll suggest something or say, hey, can you do less of this and more of this? Or somebody will get upset because one of our worship songs says Jesus instead of Yeshua. Um, you know, we're trying to reach the Jewish people. And I'll say, well, how many Jewish people have you reached? Well, not me personally, but hey, you're, you're supposed to reach the Jewish people. You know, you get a lot of stuff like that. Okay, those are opinion-based type stuff as opposed to a true offense. Um, however, let me let me just bring this all to a, a good wrap up here because I think this is really important. Is we go to our leaders the same way we would go to a brother or sister. That's how we do it. It's the same thing. You try to go to them, and if they're, you know, the scriptures give us in First Tim Timothy a litmus test of of what a leader should do. So open everybody, open up to First Timothy real quick. Okay, First Timothy. 
Okay, and it says in chapter 3, Okay. First Timothy chapter three, verse one, trustworthy is the saying, if a man aspires to the office of overseer, overseer is bishop, it also means uh, elder, uh, leader, senior rabbi, uh, or to be part of the rabbinical team, pastoral team, he desires a good work. An overseer then must be beyond criticism, which is very difficult, okay? The husband of, of one wife, you can you can't have concubines. If you do, you're just not qualified to be an elder in the congregation. <laughs> if we were in that culture, or we were back in that culture in those days, many men had more than one wife or concubines, and they could be a part of and you know they stayed that way when they got saved or whatever and was part of the congregation. But if they were in that predicament, they weren't trying to tell him, hey, get divorced so you could become an elder or leader. You just weren't qualified to become an elder because you had more than one wife. Uh, the Assemblies of God takes a look at, they consider this to mean that you can only have been married once. So therefore, if you've been married twice or you have more than one wife, you've been married more than once, you're you're disqualified from senior to be a senior pastor. I'm sorry, but I have to look at what the scriptures lay out bare and what they say. And what they say is, is very clear to a culture back 2,000 years ago that would have had more than one wife. Okay, look at the next one. Clear-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable. Hospitable, which means you're able to receive someone coming to you. Okay, um, able to teach, not addicted to wine, not violent, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. And when you have no money, you have no love for money. Well, that's not always true. Okay, managing his own household well, keeping his children under control with all respectfulness. Teddy bear, are you respecting mommy? Yes, he's asleep on her lap. Okay, uh, but if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's community? He must not be a new believer, and we talked about that. Uh, or he may become puffed up and fall into the same judgment as the devil. Uh, furthermore, he must have a good reputation with those on the outside so that he will not fall into the disgraced devil's trap. Then it goes on to deacons or servant leaders. So basically within this litmus test, it says that we need to be hospitable as leaders. Not all leaders are hospitable. Not all leaders are approachable, which surprises me because they are the senior, um, the senior leader. But when you look at some other passages, and let me just read this to you, and you, we don't have to go there. But John, we read in the book of John, chapter 3, verse 30, and it says, he must become greater and I must become less. This is John the Baptist speaking about Yeshua. It says, "I he must become greater, I must become less. And I think that's really the heart of any true leader is that we don't want to build our kingdom. We want to build the kingdom of Yeshua, and we want to become less in this movement and let, let God do what he's going to do with the people in the congregation and continue to do, but we still have to lead. But in that leadership, we can step into that place. Another great passage is found in um, James chapter 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. This is just this is as much required just for a uh, for a leader as much as it is for anybody else. So there's many, 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 many passages that fall into this category of, of uh, leader. So when you deal with a leader, you want to go to them. And Matthew 18 starts off again with being a humble childlike. Um, Michelle Brown said you have to have a humble spirit. You have to be able to go to your rabbi or your pastor with a humble heart, not a heart of arrogance or trying to go to correct that person. The scriptures actually tell you to pray for your leaders, submit to your leaders, like Marlene said. So there's a there's a way we approach this situation, just like with a mother and father, we, we approach them with respect and humility, okay? Then we speak into their life. And if you do it, even if you make a mistake approaching them or you do whatever, if you have a leader that's worth their salt at all, okay? This does not mean I do it all right all the time. But if I know I've offended somebody and they come to me, I'm, typically I respond like Jacob says. It's like, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize I offended you. Will you forgive me? And it's it's typically that's my my thing. It's like if I know I offended somebody, I say, you know what? You're right. I was being a jerk and I offended you and I'm so sorry for doing that. 
Or I will say, man, I know I offended you. I am so sorry for that. Will you forgive me? And I try to take that approach. I really do. Because I know that that they need to grow in the Lord. I need to grow in the Lord. And we both need to humble ourselves before the Lord so that we can be lifted up. So you go to them. If the leader doesn't receive you, you still have to walk in forgiveness. You still have to have to walk in that grace and that mercy. And then you do exactly what Michelle Brown said, is that you bring in another, like a typically you'd bring in an elder. So let's say you were coming to me and you couldn't get through to me. You'd, you'd go to another elder and our elders are Avi, Peter, and Rabbi David. So you go to one of them. And just say, would you be a witness? And I like that Michelle Brown had said that. So you treat a senior leader just like we would anyone else in the congregation. You have an elder who stands as a witness simply just saying, hey, I have something I have to share. Now, sometimes one of the elders might say, hey, can you give me a, a preview of what you need to talk about here or something like that? Say, no, I just need you to stand as a witness here because you don't really want to build sides on this. It's not the elder's position at this point to build a side against the, the senior rabbi or against you. It's they're going as a witness of you trying to come to the rabbi to try to win that that rabbi over or to talk about the offense that you had. And that person just stands in as a witness, okay? So if that doesn't happen, then you bring in, a, you bring in the, they say, can I have a meeting with the elder, the, the, the board of elders? Then you would take it to that point. And then after that point, then it becomes a serious thing at this point when it's a senior rat leader, the elders end, end up having to have their own meeting at this point and having to deal with it on a different level. OK, so it could become something pretty heavy duty. So if you accuse an elder, the Bible says, do not rebuke an elder. Um, uh, How does it say it? Rebuke an elder gently. Rebuke an elder gently for you may win him over type of thing. So when you bring an accusation or an offense against the leader, just make sure that it truly is an offense, okay? It truly is something that has happened that you can do. It. But most of the time, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, like what Marlene said with Rabbi Joe and what, what uh, Jacob said regarding me, is that most of the time you hope that the leader can receive you. If he doesn't receive you and he's not willing to change and he's just filled with excuses and excuses and excuses, then you have a choice either to move on to another congregation or to keep stay, stick it through and deal with the issues. And, and you've heard me say many times from the Bema, hey, let's not leave. Let's try to work through these things together. That's what builds us. That's what sharpens us. That's what makes us family. So obviously, I know I've offended a lot of people, but and people have left uh, because I've offended. I don't know all the people who've left uh, that I've offended because they haven't come talk to me. But typically, the ones who come talk to me um, uh, end up staying because we've been able to work through some things and, and deal with those kinds of things because I'll I'll, I'll offend people. I just know I will. Just being human causes me to offend people. Um, and and that makes the sense is with you guys as well. Just being humans, we're going to offend each other. We're going to say stuff. We're going to do stuff that we sometimes don't understand. We're just going to hurt each other from time to time. But so anyhow, you deal with the leaders the same way you would do with a person. OK, so hopefully that'll help you guys out in that situation. But it gets a little bit more tricky when you're dealing with the leader and then an elder has to be brought in on the situation. Hopefully the senior leader will will be humble enough to receive you, not to shame you, not to put you down. Um, but I would encourage you at that point, walk in forgiveness, but don't let it go. If it's a true offense, like let's 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 make it something that's kind of out of the ordinary. Um, and I'll use myself as an example again. A person, another brother's come to me because he sees me flirting with his wife. Okay, now that's not a true scenario here, guys. I'm just telling you guys. This. And he comes to me and I say, oh, come on, man. We're just we're just buds and we're just this and we're just that, you know, whatever like that. No, no, no. I'm really, man, it's like I just feel like you're just too close to my wife. And it's just, you know, I just don't like this situation here. Then I should say, you know what, brother? You're right. I apologize. I'm so sorry for that. Will you forgive me? And I will cut that. I will make sure that I set a boundary, a healthy boundary for this that will help not only satisfy to make sure that I'm not doing something evil, but that you would be satisfied with it. That's how we should approach those kind of situations. But let's say I just kind of brush it off and then he keeps seeing me hanging out with his wife. Then, you know, the flirtation re is it happens again. And then before you know, it goes to other stuff, to lunches or something like that. Well, he's got to he's got to he's got to take that to the next level. He's got to take that to the board of elders and say, listen, this has been going on now for a while. And I, I just I got to deal with this. Will you you know, and that kind of type of thing. 
that's when it becomes serious and that's 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 there so we've got to be careful with those kinds of situations but that goes just for anybody whether they're a senior leader or not a senior leader um we have to deal with those now again many offenses can be forgiven and just released and uh with anybody in the congregation you know they they set wrong or they looked at you wrong or they they said something that they didn't know they hurt you forgive them walk in that forgiveness that's the best key that's the best thing that we can do amen anybody else want to speak into that let me go to the gallery a lot of heavy stuff here but you know uh, libby's correct this is such a deep teaching such an important teaching guys i can't express to you guys how much how important it is because we are called to live a life of forgiveness, whether we like it or not, whether it fits our fancy or not, or suits our fancy or whatever the term is, um, tickles our fancy, I guess that's the, the term. But, you know, it's like it's very difficult to do. Um, however, don't push. Now, this is the big caveat behind this. Don't just say I forgive them and then hold something inside here. And we, we all talked about that. Some people brought that up. Libby brought that up. Marlene brought it up. We can't sweep the stuff underneath the rug. It turns into unforgiveness and bitterness and anger, resentment. To where when we look at that brother, we look at that sister, we get dis disgusted. Or we feel, we feel anger or hurt. You know, and all those kinds of things start building up. Let me share this to you guys. And it was... It was my own personality, but for whatever reason, it irked me really, really bad. Um, but I I was a new believer in the Lord. This is my last, this is a story, and then we can end on this unless somebody else wants to add a story. I was a new believer probably within a year, year and a half in the Lord. And I had noticed some things that my pastor was doing. And one of them was, as I was working for my pastor, he owned a construction business, so he was bivocational. And... I wasn't able to do stuff as fast as he wanted me to do stuff like put a window in, uh, you know, uh, put up a wall and, you know, cause I was doing construction, we were doing remodeling construction where, you know, putting up houses, everything. Uh, so I got to learn a lot and I was learning along the way and my best friend was helping me and I was learning how to do all that, but I couldn't go at the speed he wanted me to go at. And I felt like I was cutting corners and there was times where I did a particular job and he goes, oh, no, that's perfect. That's good enough or whatever. He goes, that's fine. That's fine. No worries about it. To me, I didn't feel like I did a good enough job. So here's one of these things where personality kind of conflict. I, I'm a perfectionist. I wanted to do a great job. To him, it, it'll get by. In my mind, that's what I was seeing. And I, I just, you know, he was my boss, but he was also my pastor. I didn't know what to do about this. And so I prayed about it, prayed about it, prayed about it. And I felt like I just need to talk to him and I just need to stop working for him because I. this is one of those things where it, it, it's bothering me because I feel like I'm cutting corners. And I feel like in my conscience, I feel like I couldn't do this right before the Lord. And so I went to him and I said, hey, pastor, can I talk to you about something? And he goes, yeah, sure. Adrian. And we sat down and I said, you know, I feel like I can't keep up with the speed you want me to do things. And I feel like I'm cutting corners and I, and it makes me feel like you're cutting corners because we're having to go to just make the money and not finish things. Um, but I don't know, I I'm having a struggle with this and I don't know if I should stay on or quit. Um, you know, cause I feel like I'm starting to judge you and, and all those kinds of things. He says that he goes, Adrian, I totally hear you. I love you. Thank you for coming to me. I really appreciate you telling me that. He goes, actually, matter of fact, I need to slow down a little bit and make sure that we do things right. He goes, thank you for checking me. He goes, he goes, but you know, you're you're welcome to stay on. You're welcome to leave. There's no animosity here. I love you. And you're you're, you know, you got saved in our church and we love you. And you can be a part of whatever, you know, type of thing. And I walked away from that, that meeting, not just as an employee talking to his boss, but as a as a person who belonged to that church that, you know, the name of the church at this point, it was a four square church. It was called Scapoose Four Square Church it was a legal name, but the actual name that, that we used for the church was called Church on Assignment. And it was like, I thought it was a really cool term. When I first started going, I didn't quite understand that, but I understood this church on assignment. We have an assignment to do is to present the gospel to all the nations, to walk in love, 
it was like we have an assignment to do and we're busy. And when I and him being the leader, when I saw how he responded to me as a young believer, whether I was right or wrong or dealing with my own issues or I wasn't capable of putting in a window fast enough or or putting up a wall fast enough because I felt like I was cutting corners or whatever. Um, he was able to deal with that and walk humbly. And I'll tell you, it's it's hard to lose respect for somebody like that. You guys hear what I'm saying there? It's, it was pretty powerful. That set me on a on a on a on a trail of just my mind boggling because I've never been able to do that. I wasn't able to approach my dad. I wasn't able to ever approach any of my uh my my employers. I wasn't able to even approach some friends sometimes because I hung out with a lot of type A personality guys playing basketball or doing whatever. And it's like you couldn't correct some people. And even I was considered at that, that point where people couldn't come correct me. But after I got saved and God radically changed my life, and then I saw this carried out in a biblical godly way, it changed. It it, it, it blew my mind. And I, so I just I share that story to say, don't be afraid to approach your leaders. Um, they may or may not receive you initially, but that doesn't mean they won't receive you and they won't hear what you had to say. But hopefully they'll respond in a gentle, loving way and, and really receive from you. Now, that doesn't mean I want you guys lining up tomorrow <laughs> to come to Rabbi Adrian. Okay. <laughs> Bonk me on it. <laughs> but if I have offended you, uh, please feel free to come and talk to me. I know Libby will. She doesn't have a filter. But she's like me. <laughs> But but anything that you guys want to talk to me about, we're here for you guys. We love you. I love you. Uh, Linda loves you guys. And it's hard to be offended by Linda. I don't know. I mean, I'm married to her and I might get like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, annoyed. annoyed sometimes or whatever. But it's hard to be offended by Linda. But I'm sure I offend her a lot more than she ever offends me. But she works through it so beautifully and so wonderfully. And it's, a, it's absolutely amazing. So, guys, I want to encourage you. Let's walk in love and strength and joy and really try to encourage one another to walk in that strength and that joy. And if you see, oh, here's the other thing about leaders, just to end it real quick. Please do not, if you have an issue with your senior leader, you go to them first. Please go to them first. Don't go to, to another leader and then have that leader take care of it. Okay? That's the same thing as gossip and slander. And then all of a sudden you can build a case against the senior leader by going to someone else in leadership. Okay. You need to go to them first and foremost, um, just like you would a brother or sister. Okay. That's really, really important. So, and if you're, you need to go to your brother and sister, don't go to their best friend. Um, we had a situation in our congregation not too long ago where somebody was uh, offended by something I said or did. Okay. No, it was something I did. Um, uh, I know something I didn't do. So I didn't respond by not calling this person and I didn't do something. This person went to Rabbi David and then Rabbi David came to me about the situation. So and I said, oh, okay, I thought I'd, I dealt with it. And this person actually came to me first, but then I found out that, it, okay, so what happened is this person came to me but I didn't know they had already gone to Dave, uh, Rabbi David or Jackie beforehand. So after I talked to this person, Rabbi David and Jackie called me and said, so-and-so has an issue. Maybe you want to follow up on that issue. I said, I already did. I already talked to that person, all that kind of stuff. And they go, oh, okay, that's wild. Okay, you know, type of thing. So here's what I did. I was able to take now this situation, sit down with that person again the following week and teach them Matthew 18. Okay. So I sat down with that person, not offended at all, felt like they had a legitimate reason to approach me, sat down with them and I said, hey, you know, I appreciate you coming to me. However, can I say something to you? Can I speak into your life first? And they said, sure, you're my rabbi. <laughs> Why not? And I said, okay, if you have an offense with me next time, Matthew 18 says, go to that person first and foremost. And this person was like, oh, I didn't know that. I go, yeah, you went to David or Jackie and or David and Jackie, and they came to me, even though you and I had talked, they had come to me. I'd appreciate it if you give me that opportunity to deal with you first and foremost before you go to someone else. And that person totally understood. And the way I approached it, there was no animosity, no hatred there. I was able to instill Matthew 18 with the person. And there's a closer connection between me and that person that was able to do that. 
Okay, so that's that's a more recent thing that has happened. What I shared with you guys happened many, many years ago when I was first saved in 1985. So, so anyhow, I hope these help you guys. And we can close right now unless somebody has a story they want to share. And just walk us through what you did and what you experienced. But if not, we can close. Looks like everybody's got a lot on their mind. <laughs> okay, good. Well, let's close in uh, prayer. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Marilyn. I didn't see your hand raised. Go ahead. I did, I'm trying to learn how to do these. Sometimes I remember the signals. I'm sorry. I'm in my car and it's dark. Um, and I was <laughs> listening. I, I, I did have an experience um, last year, about six months ago. And I don't mind it being recorded because a lot of times we don't, people don't understand, you know, what it takes but um you know i'm a solo practitioner and um i depend on people to when i hire them or bring them in to if they you know they're going to do something i depend on them to do it or to keep their word because people are depending on me as well and um i have to honestly tell you someone that i considered a really good friend um, <clears throat> who became, who worked for me for a period of a year and a half, uh, all of a sudden didn't keep her word. And I have to tell you, it threw me in such, um, a downward spiral because I'm used to cross training and having someone in position. And I have to honestly tell you, I legitimately cried because I had deadlines and, 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 and call ups and, and this person's life was in my hands because if I didn't get the document signed in time or, I mean, filed in time with the court, then um, they would have been deported. And I had this client for about 10 wow. years and we were nearing the end and he had five kids and his wife was sickly. His children, two of his children had sickle cell. It was really, really a case that um, she knew I needed her and she left early that Thursday and the Friday she didn't show up. She says, I'll be there Monday. I said, no problem. You know, we have call up on November 3rd and she backed out on Sunday. And I have to tell you, um, I sat at that desk <laughs> And I began to cry and I said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things. I said, God, you said you would not leave me nor forsake me. And I began to cry out and I pressed and I also had a hearing and I had to pull on the side of the road down and, 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 and the Holy Spirit said, no, the road said, no, you need to drive, pull over because the judge is like, are you driving? Because I had another court hearing. I didn't know how I was doing all of this. It was nothing but God and his mercy and I uh, called out in the name of Yeshua. I cried out. And through my tears, um, I kept decreeing and declaring that, you know, I can get it done. Long story short, I, I filed five minutes before they closed the window at the clerk's office. Five minutes. And then had to run downstairs to the um, the government attorney's office. And um, give me a second. The government attorney's office and um, run downstairs to them, and they're like, "Everybody's gone at this time of the day on a Friday." And I'm like, "Yeah, I know." And so it was nothing but the favor of God. And um, so after that, I had a lot of anger, and I couldn't understand because I'm like, "Lord, I prayed for this person. I, you know, I I prayed for her as if she was my like my very own." And I understand the scriptures when you and in, in, in Proverbs and when we're praying for someone that like they're our own brother and they're a stranger, you know, and and then they turn. And so I was so hurt. But I have to honestly tell you, every day I ask God to remove the offense out of my heart. And I repeat it that I forgive her. And um, I kept saying, I forgive her. Please, God, every time the anger would, would well up inside of me. And then she would call. And I was just like flabbergasted. I was like, I can't believe you're calling me, you know, as if nothing is wrong. And um, I have to tell you, I wound up in the hospital twice this year because in all the years that I've been practicing, um, <clears throat> and all the years that I have been practicing, 
I had never, ever not had a paralegal or a legal assistant or anyone. And it was my very, very first time. And I had um, chest pains and everything. And the um, they could find nothing wrong with me. I said, it's a spiritual attack. They could find nothing wrong. And I began to pray even harder because I was like, this is not my portion. And then I kept forgiving and forgiving and crying and forgiving. And um, that's what pushed me through because I didn't want the bitterness to seep into my heart because that's what was happening. And so when you're, uh, when you don't forgive, it's a lot of bitterness and God can't operate in bitterness. And so I was holding it in and then getting chest pains. And so God, I said, Lord, I don't know what you want me to do. I've never been in this type of situation where someone knew the situation. They knew what was at stake and to have the abandonment at that time. And I was livid. I'm not going to lie. And God continued. And I'm telling you for six months, last month was the first time I felt completely light and, and it proved itself because I spoke to her and there was no anger. There was no resentment. There was no, um, no, no bitterness. It was completely gone because I had to repent daily and I had to say, I forgive her daily. And I had to keep decreeing and God, I had to ask him, why did you take me through this? And um, he's even, he, he answered me even this morning. Um, but at the time I didn't understand. And, and so when I'm listening to you all tonight, I know that that was for God, for her. It was for me, but for her. And I saw her recently. <laughs> And she came and she, well, before then, I actually, two weeks ago, I, uh, I called her and I said, I need to know, did I offend you? Did I hurt you? Can you please tell me how I hurt you? Because I just need to know. And if I did, can you forgive me? And she said, yes, I forgive you. She said, yes, I forgive you. You didn't do anything to me. There's nothing to forgive. And I said, okay, yeah. I just wanted to make sure because I was hurting. And I said, but, you know, I, and she goes, no, I love you. We're great. You did nothing. I saw her recently, like two days ago. She came in, she hugged me so tightly. And there was no offense. There was just legitimately like things used to be, but God had to take that. And it was a daily, daily forgiveness, a daily repentance until God broke it off of me. And I'm that's that's my testimony. And so when you brought up offense, yeah. it's easy. That's that, that offense is really easy, even as a leader, as a teacher, because leaders can get offended too. And 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 you and and, and the, the twist is that that response because that person is gonna get deliverance because they're watching how you respond even if they're the yeah. ones committing it because the Holy Spirit will convict them. But that's my testimony. I don't have a problem sharing because I think it needs to be said, but I, I love this Bible study tonight with that. I um, release my mic and thank you. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Thank you for sharing that. That's a great testimony that that is showing the labor behind it. The work that you had to do to follow through on this and the work that you had to do and and you you had to deal through that and you know that you couldn't hold on to that bitterness even so much so that you had to go to see a doctor because there was so much there but you knew you had to work through that um and now in a secular world mindset if you weren't a believer it would have been easy to sit there and say hey this person is truly i'm justified in my anger because this person made things almost almost happen badly and get this entire family deported and all this kind of stuff or all you know you could stand on this justice soapbox so to speak but that's not the way of the kingdom the way of the kingdom is to not carry that offense and so you set by you you gave a beautiful beautiful i mean i mean that is a beautiful story of being able to humble yourself and walk humbly before the lord and then work through those issues because it's not easy guys 
we know it's not easy and it's it's we make it sound easy like oh just forgive that person just forgive that person but this is a true life scenario that had of uh, the consequences could have affected a lot of people in the in the overall run and so Marilyn had to work through that excellent excellent that was beautiful Michelle Brown and then Libby and then we'll close after you too hi um, my testimony is not about a leader, but you had talked earlier about struggling with forgiveness. And for me, um, I had, I will admit, I went through a period that I struggled with forgiveness. Um, I came from a household with a lot of abuse. Um, my dad abused me in every way imaginable. My mom was abusive and, um, when I tried to talk, to, you know, when I got to age that I was able to talk to them, they didn't want to hear it. I went to the church. The church didn't want to hear it or believe it. So I had gotten to a place that I just felt like I couldn't get help. I couldn't get help in the schools. So I just felt like no one wanted to believe what was happening around me. And for a little while I did, I, I got angry. I I, I was unable to forgive, but God and his mercy and his grace, um, he just always kept me. But I went through a time that I didn't have peace. I didn't have, um, I didn't have peace. And I just felt like my life was just at a standstill. And it took the humility of me humbling myself before God. And when I chose to cry out to God, when I chose to come to him, with my heart humbled, he had me go back to my dad and confront him. And I thought when I confronted him that I was going to like call out, you know, tell him all the things he did. But instead, the spirit had me call him and apologize to him and tell him I was sorry for every ill will that I thought, every for holding anger for anything that I said evil for anything that I spoken over his name. And I just started just apologizing for my behavior for even for holding on to all of this anger. And, um, and when I did, there was such a freedom that came in doing it. And later on, um, my dad really, I think he was just in shock. He really just didn't apologize much, but I had forgiveness. I let it go and I forgave him. It wasn't about waiting for him to apologize to me or even um, own whatever he did in his life. I was okay with that. And however, um, because I knew he was not a safe person, I kept my social distance. I kept my child away from him things like that. But later on, um, here a few, um, few years later, what the Lord had me do before he passed away, we was able to have a conversation. I seen him. And at the end of his life, I ended up being the person that ended up caring for him as he was suffering through cancer and all of these things. And when it was about, and my father then said to me, he says, I know that you said you forgave me, but it was your actions that I know that you truly forgive me. So in spite of whatever happened, he was able to see God through the behavior, through my humility, through the things that God did through me, not because of who I am, but because of who he is. So I say to people that Sometimes even your words, even though you apologize to somebody in your humility and your actions and your behavior of how you act is sometimes that's when they'll truly believe it because he didn't believe the words when I said I forgave him. But it was the actions that he was able to see that I have forgiven him. So I say all this to say, go in humility forgive and sometimes when you forgive not do it looking for an apology not looking for someone sometimes to own it they may never own it they may never apologize to you but true repentance comes from the heart of god and you choosing to forgive them without any 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 looking for anything in return 
And that is, that is okay. true forgiveness. Yeah. Amen. And you, you said something in your testimony there too, that you knew you forgave him when you can, you can talk about it and be around him. And there's not this returning of the hurt and the pain that you, you, you made boundaries and you set boundaries, which is really beautiful, but he was able to get convicted by what you did, not by what you said. And a very similar situation with me and my dad, what I wrote to him and told him, you know, for years and years and years, didn't hear much from him. Uh, when I did see him, it was typical. Um, uh, but it got to the point where it was really, it was beautiful because he would call me a lot of times and he did respect me. Uh, he called me more than all the brothers and sisters and he would respect me more and trust me more with some things. But then I, I kind of, some other stuff was coming to the surface a few years ago when I moved him to Washington state and I crossed that line of respecting mm -hmm. my dad, like I should have. Mm -hmm. And I've taken the steps of asking for forgiveness, but I think that mm -hmm. kind of scarred him a little bit more, you know, type of thing. But I'm hoping that relationship gets better. I mean, we have a great relationship, but it's just better um, because it's the actions that come through. And I, obviously, I still had some hurt that I had not worked through. This is a lifelong journey, guys. Um, mm -hmm. Being able to to walk in forgiveness and to be able to release people and to forgive people and to not be offended, it's a lifelong journey. It doesn't happen overnight. Some people respond instantly. Some people, it could be a lifetime. And we are still called to rise above the rubble, right? To get above it all. So um, Libby, we'll end with Libby. Thank you so much, Michelle. What a powerful testimony. Both of these testimonies, you and Marilyn are just, it's absolutely fantastic. So, uh, oh, I don't see her on here anymore. Yeah, she was tired. So she oh, did Libby have to step off? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, all right, guys, let's pray. Let's close because I think this is a powerful, powerful Bible study tonight. Um, really powerful. Uh, I think that, this takes us to another level of just learning how to walk in God's love to present that to the people around us. So, Avinu Makenu, Father, our King, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this study tonight, for the honesty, the openness, the the just the beautiful testimonies of your greatness and your love in our lives, Lord. And thank you for showing us through the scriptures how severe it is for us to hold on to the constant, hold on to unforgiveness because the consequences destroy us. They don't seem to ever destroy anybody else. They destroy us. And Lord, we know that if we walk in unforgiveness, then we know, Lord, that you, you cannot forgive us because we have closed our hearts, closed our hearts to your forgiveness because we have, we have become people of pride. And so, Lord, thank you for that. And, Lord, I pray for anybody tonight that is maybe didn't speak up tonight but is dealing with something and they have to work through that offense. I pray, Lord, that you will help these people um, work through that, give them wisdom, help them strengthen their spirit, their heart, Lord. Let them see that you are faithful in these situations. Hallelujah. So we give you glory and praise tonight, Lord, and we thank you so much for everything that you do. In Yeshua's name, we all said Amen. the hell